attend. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Fossati. I'm the Associate Director of the Southeast Asia Research Center here at the City University of Hong Kong. It is a pleasure to welcome to the third of our seminar series. If you are a regular attendee, you will know that last week we had an interesting talk about political violence in the Philippines. A few weeks before that, we had an equally interesting talk about the interactions between Southeast Asia and uh, China in ancient history. Uh, today, we have the first uh, political science uh, scientist that is uh, of the semester, Dr. Eve Warburton from the National University of Singapore. I will introduce her uh, very shortly. Now, before I do that, I would actually take uh, the opportunity uh, to remind you of our next seminar, which is scheduled for uh, Monday, the 29th, of March, so it's in two weeks from now. It will be delivered by Dr. Wu Junjie, uh, who is an expert on public policy. And the title of the talk will be Post-Crisis Capacity Building in Singapore and ASEAN. It will be a seminar focused on the recent COVID-19 pandemics and its implications for policymaking and regional integration in Southeast Asia. Uh, now, let's uh, get to today's talk. It is, uh, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Eva Warburton as uh, uh, the speaker uh, for today. Um, Dr. Warburton is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Asia Research Institute, or ARI, at the National University of Singapore. Uh, EU studies comparative politics with a geographic focus on Southeast Asia, and in particular on Indonesia. Her research is broadly concerned with identity, representation, and the political economy of policymaking in developing democracies. Dr. Warburton's research has been published in a range of journals, including Democratization, Party Politics, Electoral Studies, the Journal of East uh, Asian Studies, and the Bulletin of Indonesian Economics Studies, so a bright, uh, wide, broad, uh, range of journals, both in area studies and very prestigious political science journal as well. She is uh, also currently finalizing her first book, Manuscript, on the political economy of research nationalism in Indonesia. I should add that this book is based on her uh, doctoral uh, dissertation, her award-winning doctoral dissertation. So we're very much looking forward to read the manuscript once uh, it comes out. So, Today's talk uh, is titled, Why Democrats Abandon Democracy, Evidence from Survey for Survey Experiments. Uh, a catchy, intriguing title and a, a fancy research uh, design. We're very much looking forward to uh, hear from Dr. Warburton. Before we start, I should also mention that this uh, uh, seminar is based on a paper that uh, Eve has co-authored uh, with uh, uh, two other scholars, the first being Diego Fossati from the City University of Hong Kong, myself, and the second being Murhan Mutadi uh, from the Sharia Hidayatullah State Uni uh, Islamic University in Jakarta, in Indonesia. So uh, a collaborative project uh, among researchers based in three different, uh, uh, three different countries. Now, without further ado, if uh, the floor is yours, the virtual floor, uh, that is, we're very much looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much, Diego, for the very generous introduction. Um, and thank you very much, of course, to Mark Thompson as well, and to Diego uh, for inviting me to speak today um, at the South East Asia Research Centre. It's a huge pleasure uh, and an honour. So um, as Diego, uh, let me just share my screen. Um, as and tell me if you can all see it. How does that look? We can see it. Can see it. You know, full screen. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, uh, as Diego's already mentioned, I'll be presenting a paper today that is a co-authored paper, uh, recently published in Party Politics, uh, and it's co-authored with Diego, who just introduced me, uh, and also with Bunhanuddin Mutadi, who is a colleague of ours from Indonesia. He's not here today. Uh, but Diego obviously is. So in the Q&A, I will have uh, obviously just be pushing all of the hard curly questions onto him because uh, uh, this is very much a collaborative paper. Uh, and even though it's already been published, you know, we really do welcome critical comments and feedback. Uh, we think it's a really important topic and uh, we'd be really excited to develop it and extend the project uh, further down the track. 
So let me begin with a summary of the paper. I always like to do this so that um, everyone in the audience knows where we're going. Uh, so the research questions that really drive this paper um, are the following. So broadly, we're interested in how political polarization affects democratic quality. And I'm just going to move my screen around a bit so I can read my own slides. Uh, there we go. And the second question is a more specific question about the causal mechanisms. So uh, how do partisan, you know, to what extent do partisan loyalties trump voters' commitment to democratic institutions uh, in a polarized political setting? And we're interested in uh, uh, answering these questions in the case of Indonesia, a really important third wave uh, democratizer um, and a kind of one of the most important and largest and most populous democracies in the world. And the way in which we go about answering these questions is by using survey data. So we embed four survey experiments in a national survey in Indonesia. And what we find is that when prompted, by partisan cues, that is when they're cued by a political leader or by a political party, we find that voters become substantially more likely to support illiberal and undem undemocratic interventions. And so what we argue is that even in a developing democracy context like Indonesia, where there are these ostensibly weak partisan ties between voters and political parties, uh, polarization can intensify quickly and it can render voters commitment to democratic norms and institutions highly contingent. And this is the case even in a country where voters en masse and routinely over the years have claimed to support democracy uh, as a regime. So that's the sort of the basic um, outline of the paper and of the presentation today. So let's step back a bit and look and sort of discuss the, the sort of the background to this project um, and the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the context in which we developed this project. So first of all, we know that democracy is in decline or in retreat all around the world. And this has been tracked now for many years by sort of the big uh, comparative democracy indexes like Freedom House and VDEM. And we also know that the way in which democracy is eroding uh, in the contemporary era era has uh, sort of particular features. One of which is that a lot of this erosion is taking place in the hands of elected leaders. So it's, the, it's leaders who are being elected who are then uh, sort of hollowing out and chipping away at democratic institutions. They're not necessarily openly advocating for uh, a, a regime change, a kind of authoritarian reversal. Instead, they remain committed to democracy, rhetorically at least, uh, while still kind of engaging in this sort of um, hollowing out of democratic institutions. And of course, we're thinking here of, um, you know, Duterte in the Philippines or Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, and uh, Erdogan in Turkey and the like. And, and what is so particular to these sorts of leaders is that they remain popular uh, and they sustain their legit legitimacy as directly elected leaders. Uh, and so that's one trend that, that, uh, this, that this paper is interested in. And the second trend that it's interested in is that at the same time that, that we've seen this kind of um, democratic erosion taking place all around the world, we've seen an intensification of polarization in many democracies. And I'm just highlighting this book here on, the, uh, on your screen, Democracies Divided, it's an, um, an edited book by Thomas Carruthers of the Carnegie Institute and Andrew O'Donoghue, uh, because it takes a, re a real, uh, I think a really um, important and interesting sort of tour of democracies all around the world that are experiencing this intensification of polarization that kind of outlines the different ways in which polarization is dangerous to democracy. And what the authors, and I'm full disclosure, I'm one of the authors, uh, what they find is that uh, ideological and identity-based divisions have deepened in many democracies, uh, and what they, from America to Indonesia to Turkey to Poland, and what they find is that partisans are going further and further apart, and animus between political rivals is increasing at the same time that democracy is backsliding and de democratic quality is declining in many of these countries. So how does polarization contribute to democratic erosion? What are the kind of mechanisms that scholars have identified? Well, so first of all, what it does is it raises the stakes of political competition. So when a situation arises where sort of, you know, uh, where two groups divided politically, uh, where they begin to see each other uh, and competition between each other as a kind of zero sum game, they begin to see electoral competition uh, as being a sort of winner takes all situation, a loser loses all kind of situation. And what that does is it creates the conditions under which elites and mass support for liberal aspects of democracy, like protection for freedoms and liberties for everyone, 
become increasingly contingent or conditional. So in other words, that's the, the support for, uh, you know, broad democratic norms and institutions for everyone uh, becomes contingent upon, not becomes but contingent upon or reliant upon uh, their own interests and their own victory in democratic competition. So yes, people will support democratic institutions in the abstract, but in practice, uh, in a really highly polarized setting, what elites and politicians want is democracy only if it serves their partisan interests, only if it leads to uh, their political enemy being kept out of office and then remaining in office. In other words, democratic institutions and support for them become a kind of second order priority for elites and for citizens. So, and what scholars who are working in this space have become uh, increasingly interested in is looking more specifically at the mechanisms at work uh, uh, when it comes to sort of popular support for democracy. So what's going on at the citizen level rather than the elite level? And the way in which scholars have gone about trying to investigate this relationship between polarization and public support for democracy and for democratic institutions uh, is to use surveys and experimental methods to try and use these sorts of approaches to reveal how or the ways in which and when voters become willing to trade off key democratic principles like separation of powers, uh, protection of civil liberties and electoral fairness for their own partisan interests. And there's been a lot of really interesting work done just in the last few years, but a lot of that work is sort of motivated by what's been going on in the US where you've seen this, particularly during the Trump era, really intense polarization between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and so what that means is a lot of the studies that we have uh, on this particular subject uh, are almost exclusively based on the United States or sometimes cases from established democracies in Europe. What about what's going on in developing democracies? Because in developing democracies, we still see these twin uh, trends of democratic erosion on the one hand and political polarization as well in the other. Uh, we see it in our own region, we see it in Thailand, of course, and we see it a lot in Indonesia, and that's the case, you know, I'll be I'm getting into a lot more detail in, in just a moment. So in developing democracies, we, we have these two trends, democratic decline, uh, in, intensification of polarization in some, in some contexts, but of course, developing democracies look very different, their institutions look very different when compared to the established and advanced democracies like the, in North America and, and, in, and in parts of Europe. And how do they look different? Well, we know that in a lot of de developing democracies, uh, party institutions tend to be weaker and party identification or feelings of closeness and partisanship, uh, loyalty to parties tends to be a lot lower. It's these, in countries like Indonesia, clientelism is, a really, is really widespread and voters are often connected to their parties through patronage networks, uh, through processes and systems of gift, material gift giving and the like, rather than uh, you know, rather than having those sorts of strong historical ideological kind of based connections to parties that you find in North America and, and, and in parts of Europe. And of course, in uh, developing democracies and, and specifically in, in Indonesia, of course, parties are also often characterized as cartelistic. So you don't get that kind of clear division between opposition and government that you get in established democracies. Instead, in a country like Indonesia, parties tend to all be kind of working together after an election to get into office, to access the state and to access patronage resources. So there's this different sort of context that uh, makes us kind of, I guess, kind of question whether the relationship between polarization and democratic decline is the same or not, whether these effects are the same or not in, de in a developing democracy context. So our paper tries to leverage some of the theoretical and methodological insights from this growing, this new body of work on polarization in established democracies and to see if it travels to and helps us understand the relationship between polarization and democratic decline uh, in other sorts of developing democracy contexts and particularly in Asia. So we look at Indonesia, the case of Indonesia. So um, let me just explain a little bit about the background of Indonesia and, and what's been going on in terms of its democracy and in terms of polarization in recent years. So Indonesia has long been hailed as a major sort of democratic success story. Uh, it's one of the major success stories of the third wave of democratizations, 
At the end of the 90s, what was what, what was this sort of stable authoritarian regime headed up by General Suharto uh, basically fell apart very quickly in the wake of the Asian economic financial crisis uh, and a popular movement, a popular pro-democracy movement. And really since the end of the 90s, since that transition, Indonesia has held uh, sort of countless local uh, and national elections, uh, direct elections for local leaders and for the and for, and for the presidency uh, and overall what uh, comparativists in particular have kind of concluded is that Indonesia's democracy is 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 well for the, until recently is relatively healthy relatively competitive uh, and and certainly compared to its neighbors relatively stable we also know that polls continue to show that Indonesians support democracy over authoritarianism and that's been the case for the last decade or so really consistently high levels of support for democracy from um, from among citizens and historically, it's also been described as one of the least polarized countries in Asia. And this is, of course, uh, partly due to, uh, the, the, to the kind of the system that I've just described, that kind of patronage based system of politics and the cartelistic behavior of many of the parties uh, in Indonesia. So, you know, until the, uh, very recently, you just didn't hear the word polarization being used at all, really, uh, in political science work on Indonesia. But all of that has really changed over the past five years. We've seen uh, really since 2013, but uh, you know, the, the democratic indices like Freedom House, uh, like VDEM, the Economics Intelligence Unit, and of course the qualitative work being done on Indonesia's democracy have all really tr have tracked this decline uh, in the quality of its institutions, especially on uh, indicators like freedom of expression, uh, and freedom of organization, but also now sort of more in terms of the quality of Indonesia's parties uh, and the like. Um, at the same time, and I think this was something that was less predictable, I think, in the eyes of, of, uh, of many political scientists working within and outside of Indonesia, we've seen a real intensification of polarization over the same sort of period since 2014 onwards, between on the one hand, what we would call kind of political Islamists, and on the other, on the other side, religious pluralists. Uh, on the one hand, political Islamists, and we should say that, you know, this is a really kind of um, deep and long held, I guess, um, division within Indonesia's, uh, within Indonesian politics, these sort of two different streams of Indonesian politics, if you like, um, that have kind of remained latent for, for most of the democratic period. And on the one hand, we have political Islamists who seek a larger role for Islamic precepts, uh, Islamic um, beliefs and symbols in public life and in political life especially. Uh, and they're represented by several political parties like PKS, for example, uh, in the formal political system, but also they're represented by different sorts of community organizations as well. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the religious pluralists, sometimes called nationalists within Indonesia, who uh, support a much more multi-religious sort of foundation uh, for the Indonesian state and for politics in general. And that's represented, I guess, um, most powerfully uh, by PDIP, on the, that's the political party, one of Indonesia's most pluralist political parties to which Joko Widodo, the current president, belongs, uh, but also other nationalist parties like Golkar um, and some of the more kind of personalist uh, political vehicles like Democrat, uh, SB, what president, former president SBY's party and the like. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. No, he's uh, officially uh, the Democrat was a religious pluralist party, uh, which has since really in the democratic era, in the Jokowi era, uh, become much closer to the Islamist um, kind of political stream. But, uh, and these, as I said, these are sort of long held uh, ideological differences that have animated Indonesia's politics for a long time. But it's really been since the rise of President Joko Widodo uh, in 2014 and his um, once major opponent, uh, Prabowo Subianto, it's competition between these two elites that has really mobilized this latent, this latent ideological division. So uh, Prabowo Subianto and his party Gurindra while Prabowo is not an Islamist uh, in him, you know, in the way that he practices his religion himself, nor officially, you know, is his party Garindra at all an Islamist party. What Prabowo did when he ran up against Jokowi in 2014 and 2019 was to ally with the, the Islamist political parties uh, and Islamist organizations outside of the political system and to kind of leverage Islamist symbols and rhetoric and, and sectarian modes of political mobilization in order to try and defeat his more pluralist um, opponent in Joko Widodo. Uh, 
And the competition between these two uh, has really, as I said, has kind of mobilized these old divisions. And to the point where in 2019, voters' uh, religious and ideological proclivities really became a direct predictor of who they voted for. So what we found is that, you know, uh, in parts of Indonesia where we know that we know there are sort of large minor uh, religious minority groups, where there are kind of more traditionalist and pluralist uh, Muslim communities in Central and East Java, for example, all of those sorts of areas voted on mass for Jokowi. And then what we found is that in parts of Indonesia, like Sumatra, um, West Java, where there are kind of more Islamist communities uh, and modernist, you know, historically modernist Islamic organizations, they all sort of voted en masse for Prabowo. So it became a very polarized um, electorate in 2019. So we know this, this polarization has been intensifying. We know uh, democratic decline has been increasing in Indonesia. But to date, we've had no systematic empirical investigation into how polarization has impacted popular support for democracy in Indonesia. And so that's what we set out to do in this paper. So we use a survey. Uh, and what we did is we embedded a series of experiments into a population-based survey uh, on a representative sample of the Indonesian population. And the survey was conducted by Indikator Politik. Um, and one of our authors, uh, Burhanuddin Muhtadi, is uh, not only a very um, high profile and influential uh, in, uh, political intellectual in Indonesia, uh, he is also the director of this very well, widely respected um, survey institute in Indonesia. Uh, so it was his institution that conducted the survey and these were face-to-face -face interviews because this, well, we, this was um, conducted in late December, uh, sorry, in late 2018, sort of early to mid-December. So before obviously the, um, the pandemic, uh, the good old days. So we used multi-stage random sampling techniques based on the 2010 census uh, and it's broadly representative across Indonesia's um, 34 provinces. So we designed four survey experiments, and these experiments are about, and I'm going to walk you through each one, but they're about concrete policy interventions. So rather than asking citizens whether they support, you know, democracy in the abstract, democratic regimes over authoritarian regimes, whether we, we didn't ask them sort of broadly about satisfaction with democracy, what we wanted to do instead was to take real policy debates that have been uh, taking place in Indonesia over the past few years that deal with um, questions of democratic institutions, the design of democratic institutions in Indonesia. And, and we asked whether they supported or, or didn't support um, these particular institutions. And these policy interventions that we chose are broadly kind of reflective of key dimensions of liberal democracy. So that, you know, these interventions are about participation, accountability, electoral competitiveness, civil liberties and the like. Now, the way it's designed, we have um, a control group, of course, in each treatment, which received no political cues. Uh, then we had one treatment group, which received a party cue. So they received a cue from either PDIP um, supporting or opposing one of the policy interventions, um, or a cue from uh, uh, saying that a Gurindra politician supports or opposes the given policy uh, intervention. The second treatment group received a leader cue. Which, which, uh, within which uh, they were told that Jokowi either supported or opposed a particular intervention or Prabowo opposed or supported an intervention. And we should also add that these cues reflected the real world positions of parties and leaders in these sorts of, in the debates about these particular policy interventions. So we're not misleading uh, our respondents in any way, uh, rather we're kind of pulling out, you know, Jokowi's position on a particular intervention, Prabowo's position on a particular intervention over the years, and we're using them. Um, and it's also the case that, the, that we design these policy interventions to demonstrate or to reflect the reality, which is that neither side is more democratic than the other. And in fact, both sides have taken anti-democratic positions uh, when it suits their interests. And that's, again, what these policy interventions reflect. So let me walk you through each one as it's kind of an, I think it's a, you know, a really interesting and important part of the, of the paper is the way we, we designed these these experiments. So, so we have one question, one, one experiment on support for re, uh, religious bylaws. Uh, we, we translate it into English as religious bylaws, but, um, or we use the word religious bylaws, but in Indonesia, that's the equivalent of sort of Sharia bylaws or Islamic bylaws, because they're the ones that are sort of quite uh, popular in certain parts of the country. And there's been a lot of debate about them over the years. Um, uh, because local um, local governments in Indonesia have the capacity to um, rule on certain aspects of 
you know, social and cultural life at the local level. And that's included, um, you know, designing laws that reflect elements of Sharia. So sort of, you know, um, introducing rules that kind of constrain women's dress, uh, bylaws about alcohol and gambling and the like. So, so this is the, this is the kind of, um, uh, the policy debate, you know, the, the, the legitimacy of these sorts of bylaws um, has been debated for some years in Indonesia. So uh, we, this is the prompt or this is the information that respondents were given. So in the lead up to the 2019 presidential elections, there has been debate amongst the community about local government regulations that are based on religion. I'm going to read you some different opinions concerning this issue. So if you're in the control group, you receive no cue. So you just had the information that some people believe that Indonesia is a country based on law, um, uh, sorry, and no particular religion, sorry, based on, um, not based on a particular religion, uh, and religious regu regional regulations based on religion may violate the constitution and have the potential to undermine the rights of minorities and women. If you're in the party queue treatment, it's PDIP that endorses this position. If you're in the leader treatment, uh, the leader queue treatment group, you receive a queue that Jokowi endorses this position. On the other hand, some or Garindra or Prabowo, depending on which group you're in, believe local regulations based on religion are legitimate because Indonesia is a majority Muslim country and such regulations do not violate the constitution or undermine the rights of minorities. So in this case, you see that PDIP sort of endorses this, um, the kind of, you know, the position that would reflect a more liberal democratic position, uh, you know, where majoritarian, religious majoritarianism, you know, shouldn't be the basis of, 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 of regional laws. And on the other hand, Prabowo and his Islamist coalition would be, you know, support these religious bylaws. A second uh, really important uh, debate that's been taking place in Indonesia in recent years is legitimacy of direct local elections. At the moment, Indonesians can, uh, we have, they hold direct elections for mayors, for governors, uh, and, uh, and for other reg and then regional heads. And uh, those direct elections are supported widely by Indonesians, but there's been a lot of debate over the years and attempts by the political elite to roll back those elections and to bring an end to direct elections such that regional leaders would be um, chosen by parliament, basically by local provincial legislatures, uh, provincial and, and um, district legislatures. So the, 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 um, the vignette that the respondents were given was this. So direct elections for local leaders known as Pilkada um, have been the subject of debate in Indonesian society. And I'm going to read you some different opinions concerning this issue. So in this instance, Prabowo, if you're in the group of, uh, if you're in the control group, you just get some. If you're in the treatment, it's Garindra or Prabowo endorsing a position that says direct elections should be brought to an end, should be rolled back. They believe that implementing local regulations is too expensive and fuels corruption, and that for this reason, direct elections should be replaced by indirect elections. And this is a position that at various points um, over time, uh, Prabowo has actually supported explicitly. And then in this instance, it's Jokowi and PDIP that endorse, you know, maintaining direct um, local elections. Um, Diego, I suppose I haven't been timing myself, so let me know uh, how I'm going for time and if I need to worry. <laughs> uh, a third, our third experiment is about electoral thresholds. So this is something that's a little bit more technical, and as we'll see in the in the results, it's it's a debate that's less salient in the minds of Indonesian voters, uh, but it's one that's become very, it's very important. It's still debated a lot in the media, um, and uh, the and uh, Jokowi's sort of incumbent coalition um, strongly believes that electoral the electoral threshold should remain high, uh, and those in opposition, no longer Garindra, but I'll explain that in a moment. Um, PKS, PAN and Democrat, they tend to uh, argue in favour of a lower electoral threshold for nominating a presidential candidate because these are the smaller parties, they're in opposition and they believe that it's, it makes the whole system less competitive. So recently there has been debate about the electoral threshold for nominating a presidential candidate, which currently sits at 20% uh, of the vote and 25% of um, seats in parliament. And that's what you have to have to nominate a presidential candidate. And I'm now going to read some different opinions concerning this issue. So in this instance, PDIP and Jokowi want to maintain a higher presidential threshold. So if you're in the treatment group for a party, PDIP endorses this position. If you're in the treatment group for leader, Jokowi endorses the position that the presidential threshold um, is designed to ensure that presidential candidates are supported by parties that have a strong presence in the par parliament. And so it should remain high. On the other hand, uh, Prabowo or Gorindra believe that the presidential threshold is too high, it prevents the emergence of alternative presidential candidates and people have less choice. 
we can talk about in the Q and A so that, uh, about this particular vignette on this particular case because I think there are sort of intellectual debates on both sides about electoral thresholds. It's not immediately clear, you know, that one position is undemocratic and the other is is democratic. But in the context of, of Indonesia and the debates that have been taking place, it's very clear that uh, for those for the incumbents and for the big parties in government, um, they have a, a, a real interest in maintaining a higher electoral, a higher presidential threshold. And for the smaller parties and for the sake of competition and for voters' choice, um, they're the ones that want something, that, that want more, more, more electoral competition, essentially, and a fairer playing field. Finally, uh, the Purple Ormas, which is the community, this is a debate about um, a government regulation to replace the law on uh, community organisations. Uh, and this was an, an intervention introduced by Jokowi to change an existing law on community organizations such that the incumbent government was given broad powers to be able to, uh, to shut down and to ban organizations that it deemed uh, to be in contradiction of the Panchasila or the, or the sort of the, the state ideology, the pluralist state ideology. Uh, and it was widely criticized by human rights activists uh, really is kind of um, a tool that could easily be used for repressive uh, for repressive means. Um, and so it's, it's, it's widely understood to be an illiberal and undemocratic intervention introduced by the Jokowi government. So um, in this instance, Gorindra and Prabowo believe that the government um, acted arbitrarily because the Purpu Ormas, as it's known, uh, violates the community's freedom of assembly and organization. So this is it's Prabowo and it's a Gorindra treatment groups that are kind of endorsing the more democratic position. On the other hand, it's PDIP. If you're in the treatment group, you're getting the information that PDIP or Jokowi um, believe that the government acted within its authority, oh, pardon the typo, to disband organizations that threaten Indonesia and violate the Panchasila. So let's look at some of the results here. Um, so what we've done here, I'm sorry if it's a bit small for people, um, we're gonna look at the descriptive statistics for, uh, for the control group. And what we're doing is, is showing you the results um, organized into partisan groups. And the way in which we measure, measure partisanship is not by um, the, the questions traditionally asked, which is how close do you feel to political party? Because Indonesians, I think the, the, the level of party ID is so low in Indonesia. I think it's around sort of less than 10% of people now say they feel close to a political party. But we simply asked them who they plan to vote for in the upcoming elections. And we use that as an indication of partisanship, a kind of a sort of soft indication of partisanship. And so what we have, we've divided our, um, our respondents into PDIP partisans, Garindra partisans, uh, and those who have no preference or no partisanship uh, in, in terms of those you know, who, who say they wouldn't vote for either of those two parties. And, and then we have um, leader preference. So those who would vote for Jokowi and those who would vote for Prabowo. And then we have the no preference group. Um, and so what you can see here um, is within the, this control group, so they haven't been exposed to any cues, we can see uh, how many people, the differences between the different, the different, um, the different partisans in terms of their agreement or disagreement uh, with these different laws. So in terms of religious laws, we can see that there aren't major differences between the three groups here, but of course, amongst Garindra supporters, you do see that's where there's more support for religious bylaws. It's actually the big difference here is that a lot of uh, PDIP supporters say they just don't know. They don't have a position on, on religious bylaws. And the, in terms of disagreement, the numbers are really similar. Uh, and the pattern is, um, is very similar for Jokowi and Prabowo. So there is a difference. You do see in the control group, Prabowo supporters being more likely to support religious bylaws as we would expect, uh, but the differences aren't major. When it comes to support or uh, support for direct elections or disagreement with abolishing direct elections, you can see a strong majority in all groups, whether you're a PDIP voter, a Garindra voter uh, or other, you're a strong majority uh, disagree with abolishing direct local elections. But still, it's a little bit higher. So, uh, support for abolishing them is a little bit higher in the Garindra group. And again, the pattern is really similar here uh, when it comes to uh, partisans organized by leadership preference, Jokowi versus Prabowo. And the pattern is sort of similar again, and we look at the electoral threshold. So here, as I said, this is um, a debate. It's a little more technical. It's a little less salient in the minds of voters. So you have a much higher level of, I don't know the answer to this question. or um, And then you also find that agreement 
is you know there's really no difference between partisan groups here or and, and a, a, a bit of a difference here between Prabowo and Jokowi voters with Jokowi voters more likely to agree with the electoral threshold remaining high um, but a, again uh, you know the, the partisan groups are pretty similar. Um, on the Purple Ormas or the CSO directive we translated into English do you agree with its implementation this illiberal inter intervention um, and you can see here that you know, there is a difference. Jokowi, people who want to, who, who work with Jokowi can kind of support it. They know it's a, it's a, it's a policy introduced by, um, by, by the government, by Jokowi, but even a lot of Prabowo voters support it as well. Um, and, and, you know, there's not a huge difference here. So that's it within the control group. So there's some polarization in the directions that we would assume in the control group. Uh, but now let's look at the differences between, um, between these partisan groups. Uh, once we introduce the um, once we introduce the uh, the treatments, so this is a result for party cues. Um, it's an estimated support for anti-democratic measures as estimated in a full model. So we're controlling for you know gender, age, religion, education, and income. And what we're finding is that I'm sorry, and I should add here to explain to you that um, we have indicated Garindra partisans with the blue line, PDIP partisans with the grey line. Uh, and and then the black line are sort of non-partisans essentially, and in the control group you can see that uh, the estimated position, the estimated policy preference of these groups, um, the difference between them is really slight. So they're all kind of clustered together in the control group when it comes to support for Islamic law, for direct elections, for all of these policy interventions. The difference between partisan groups and their policy positions is really small, and then when you introduce the treatment. Uh, we see, you know, a really substantial effect. So you can see them sort of polarize and move in opposite directions. So here you see that it's the Garindra uh, partisans moving to sort of, you know, they're the ones that kind of support Islamic, uh, introduction of Islamic law at the local level, support abolishing direct elections when queued to do so by, um, by uh, that, that Garindra, by, when queued with a Garindra politician supporting those, those interventions. And then here, when it comes to the electoral threshold and the CSO directive, you can see that PDI, the, the effect is really large and in the opposite direction. So it's the, uh, you know, when it's PDIP uh, being uh, endorsing the electoral, the high electoral threshold, when it's PDIP endorsing the Purple Ormas, PDIP partisans increased in their support uh, in their level of support for these, for these sorts of interventions. And the effect is pretty much the same uh, when we look at leader cues. So here, this is a leader cues. Again, we see differences between the partisan groups and the control group is really small. Uh, when queued with a leadership, the leader prompt, uh, partisans positions are very, very different. And you can see the kind of, the difference in partisan positions changes substantially. And you see that gap, that really substantial gap forming. So how do we analyze these results? Well, what we conclude is that uh, partisan cues can lead people to, can indeed lead people to abandon democratic institutions uh, and to support illiberal policies. And, you know, this is really in line with the results that, uh, that uh, scholars working on America, scholars working on parts of Europe, what they were finding as well, that when you cue uh, partisans to support um, illiberal interventions, uh, they, they do so. But we find that what's, what's different about our, our paper is that we find that, you know, that partisan cues can undermine the foundations of democratic support, even in a country where very few voters are reporting feeling close to political parties. Uh, and, you know, where clientelism seems to, you know, where, where practices of clientelism and patronage politics loom large. Um, and across various experiments, we're still finding respondents um, are responsive to partisan leadership cues, even when the indicator of partisanship is a really simple question about voting intention. Um, and the question is sort of why, you know, why, why might that be the case? You know, how do we explain this sort of puzzle that you get such strong partisan effects in a country that for so long people have kind of said, well, you know, partisan connections aren't really that deep in Indonesia. People don't report their feeling close to parties. Um, there's no real opposition, there's no real difference between opposition and government. Well, we think, and you know, Diego has done a lot of work on this in other papers as well, um, and that is, there tends to be, I think, an underappreciation for um, the role that ideology plays in voter choice. 
um, and for the ideological foundations of clientelist networks in Indonesia. So even though um, voters are so often connected to politicians and parties through clientelist networks, those clientelist networks are often embedded within uh, and leverage religious organizations and community organizations that are, are kind of um, ideological, uh, ideological in their character. And so what that means is that when you have a situation like we've had in Indonesia since 2014, where you have a kind of intense political competition between two different leaders who choose to mobilize um, these different identity-based networks and the kind of organizations that reflect those different um, ideological streams of Indonesian politics, then polarization can deepen relatively quickly. Uh, and you can get this kind of partisan effect um, you know, uh, even when that, even when people sort of claim to not feel so close to parties, uh, in fact, they 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 are obviously uh, looking to that, especially when it comes to PDIP, and especially when it came to Prabowo when he was once this kind of figurehead for the Islamist political um, stream in Indonesia. Those partisan effects can be really strong, uh, and can as we as we demonstrate can uh, render voters' support for these democratic institutions contingent and can shift people's sort of support for democracy. And so what we show also, uh, the point that we make in this paper, is that the negative impact of partisan polarization is perfectly compatible with a high degree of public support for democracy in mass public. So, you know, in our survey, 82% of respondents in our sample agree that democracy is the best form of government over authoritarianism. Um, and yet we find that when we ask them about specific institutions, that um, that high level of support sort of falls away really quickly. Uh, and so what we argue is that there seems to be a sort of over-reliance sometimes on abstract measures for democratic support, both in the literature on Indonesia and more broadly. You know, for many, many years, I think um, scholars have kind of just pointed to this high level of support of, of you know, popular support in polls um, among Indonesians you know, for, democ for democracy over authoritarianism, for satisfaction with democracy and how democracy is working. But that might be overstating, I guess, the, you know, the depth of public commitment to democracy, um, especially when you ask about specific institutions and a specific, especially when you, um, when you inform or when you present uh, voters with um, information that their chosen political leader or party endorses an especially illiberal intervention. Because and once we delve into these specific institutions, we find that in fact, people are relatively easily attracted to illiberal and anti-democratic interventions when endorsed by, by their co-partisans. So what are our sort of concluding you know, remarks? Um, well, just, you know, to bring us all, to bring us back to the beginning into the literature that this paper engages with, you know, we, we know that ordinary citizens have an important role to play uh, in preserving democratic institutions once they're established, and to constrain uh, possible authoritarian elites, um, and they have to be willing and to act and to uh, preserve democratic institutions and to punish incumbents um, for anti-democratic behaviour. And you know, citizens really form, I guess, an ultimate kind of check. <clears throat> especially in developing democracy contexts where rule of law is weaker, um, where institutions um, are much more vulnerable to the predatory attacks by undemocratic elites. And so you need citizens to essentially defend democracy and defend democratic institutions against the kind of hollowing out uh, that's taking place in so many parts of the world um, that, uh, by elected elites. And so the presence of an engaged public that's willing to defend them is, is, is essential for democratic survival. Now it's against this background that we argue partisan polarization is a major threat for young and established democracies alike, and that extreme polarization can compromise the willingness of ordinary citizens uh, to preserve democratic institutions. Again, because uh, what happens in polarized settings is that democratic values and support for particular institutions become subordinate to partisan loyalties uh, and to partisan priorities. And I think that's what um, our survey experiment demonstrated uh, in the Indonesian case. Um, and I'd like to, my last, my last slide, I just wanted to re-emphasize that um, this is a collaborative piece. Uh, we work together, I work together with Diego Fasati and Burhanuddin Mutadi on this, uh, and it's uh, just recently published in Party Politics and, and you can download it and read the results in more detail there. Um, and that's it, I think I spoke really quickly and I'm probably under time, but 
Diego. <laughs> oh, you're right on time. And in fact, uh, thanks for delivering such a great talk and uh, abiding by our time uh, limits. Uh, this is great. Um, and I, I did look much younger in that picture, you must say. Um, <laughs> Very striking. Lovely. And, and Bodhan really looks great as well. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, thanks again, Eve. Uh, we had like um, a, a good 45 minutes for questions and answer from, uh, from, our, uh, from our audience. So the way we usually do it is uh, we use the Zoom functions, especially the chat, but also uh, given that the format is still the format of a meeting, in fact, uh, our participants can actually speak up or raise a hand uh, and uh, they can pose their questions uh, directly. So there's not much need for a, a, for a moderator uh, in, uh, uh, in that respect. Um, so let's keep an eye on the chat. Uh, and uh, if anyone has a question, I see uh, Mark is raising uh, his hands, his virtual hand uh, already. Mark, if you want to, uh, to start with, uh, uh, with the first question, you're, you're very welcome to do so. Please unmute yourself. Thanks, Diego, and thanks, Eve, for that great talk. Um, there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very rich paper. There's a lot, lot to say, uh, but uh, I'll try to contain myself. Um, I, I really like your point about uh, ideological polarization being underestimated. I think for too long we've seen clientelism and ideolo ideology as, as mutually exclusive. I think that's wrongheaded. It's always been wrongheaded, but we're sort of getting around to figuring that out. Um, and uh, that, you know, ideological polarization, as you show, can work through these uh, clientelistic networks. Um, I also like your point about abstract questions about democracy. In the U.S. context, when talk about apple pie questions that really don't mean much, most U.S. Republicans, I'm sure, would would, would say they're supporters of democracy, but some of them might still storm the Capitol, in fact, in the name of, of democracy. So uh, I think that's another good point. I would maybe add perhaps parties themselves are another abstract statement. Like people disown, you know, because parties have kind of a bad reputation everywhere, I suppose, but in Indonesia, a place like Indonesia, again, clientelism would play a role in particular, but that doesn't seem to matter in terms of their ideological affiliations when it gets down to it. Um, so, my question is about, so, so, so how, you know, as you say, how do you explain this? It, unless I missed something, you didn't really talk much about the Aliran tradition, uh, which I may be mispronouncing. Uh, but, uh, you know, that seems to me was one way, you know, to say that, you know, even though things have changed uh, in Indonesian society, that, that these things are very deep rooted. They go back to even before the Saharto era uh, and, 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 you know, aspects of Indonesian political development go back to the, the colonial, just like, you know, scholars trace the development of the Democrats and, and, and the Republicans to, to some of these deep-seated cleavages. So I'm, I'm wondering about that. Um, and I'm also wondering about the, um, the question of pluralist versus uh, Islamists. So in, in a sense, what you're saying is both sides are guilty of eroding democracy, and both of their partisans kind of are willing to go along with that. Of course, there is the argument by the pluralists that they are intervening in order to defend democracy. And, you know, Germany has long had that discussion uh, for obvious reasons about at some point needing to uh, outlaw uh, anti-democratic parties. And, you know, US is now dealing with domestic terrorism. So I, I wondered if you deal with that, that aspect. And, and, and finally, um, what significance is it that at least in, in theory, Prabo and uh, Jacobi have reconciled? I mean, after all, he's in the government. So uh, what implication does that have? Thank you. Should I just answer directly? Yes. Oh, go okay. ahead. Yeah, great. No, um, thanks so much, Mike. These are great questions. And I think we probably do a better job in the paper than I did in the presentation of, of talking about the sort of, of Aliran and the deep roots of this ideological division within Indonesian politics. Um, and yes, you're absolutely, you were pronouncing it correctly. Uh, and it is um, absolutely true that this division between pluralists on the one hand and Islamists on the other is as is, is old as the Indonesian state and, and back to the colonial era as well. Um, but, you know, during the Suharto era and he kind of, you know, Suharto sort of leveraged those, that Ali, Ali Ran politics, but at the same time suppressed it. Um, and he especially suppressed that kind of the Islam, the more Islamist end um, of, of this, of the spectrum. So when Indonesia's democracy you know, when during that transition to democracy, 
there was a lot of excitement and um, a lot of you know political parties that were established and including PKS um, in order to channel that kind of Islamist set of preferences into the political system. Um, at the same time, as Indonesia's democracy evolved, it became, you know, as we all know now, it became so much more um, uh, clientelist. It became, you know, vote buying became widespread. It was became very clear in the, you know, within a few elections that, that parties weren't necessarily going to be behaving in a way um, in which, you know, that the reflected their ideological divisions. They were always willing to work together to get into government. You know, there was such little difference between them in terms of the way they behaved in, in office. And also, I think that the SBY years, you know, in, in part, this is a function of the way SBY governed as well from 2004-2014 and his um, cultivation of big rainbow coalitions that, for the most part, when analysing Indonesian politics, you know, even though the kind of the Ali Ran identification of different sorts of political parties remained, in practice, people sort of argued that there was no real difference. These ideological differences were almost sort of superficial and symbolic rather than concrete or effect or, without, or consequential. So the big question I think for Indonesia analysts going forward is, was were the SBY years kind of an anomaly? Was it sort of the way he governed and his, you know, religious nationalist party in the way he wanted to bring together both both sides in a way you know was that was it a function of him and 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 those those early years of indonesia's democratic development and are we getting back into kind of the real indonesia which is just um, a system that in fact is more ideological and is more polarized um or is this something that you know is or is it a function of the jokowi era and the return of pdip the most pluralist party within indonesia's party system to a position of such power um and i think it's I think it's probably um, a bit of both, um, uh, and I, but I do think that you know now that the sort of the cat's out of the bag in a way, we've seen the way in which you can, the way in which identity cleavages can be mobilised for political ends. I think this will be a much more prominent feature of the of Indonesian politics and the party system, to, um, you know, for years to come now. Um, so that's sort of a long rambling answer to that question. Um, both sides are guilty, but the pluralists sort of, you know, more right, I guess, they're sort of the ones defending democracy for the, for, for, for you know, in the name of pluralism. Um, and this is a really, you know, Greg Feely's done some really fantastic work uh, dealing with this very question, which is, and it's, as you said, it's a question that democracies all around the world face, is what do, what do you do with um, illiberal constituencies or illiberal organisations in a liberal democracy? Um, and, uh, you know, the sort of, the position is that you sort of have to deal with them within a legal framework, within a liberal legal framework. Um, and that's what the Jokowi administration, the pluralists in power now have not been doing. And yet Marcus Mitzner has obviously written this great paper called, um, uh, def what is, what's the exact wording? Fighting illiberalism with illiberalism. Um, and that's the, this idea that what the Jokowi, the kind of tools that the Jokowi administration has, has used aren't necessarily necessary in order to deal with Islamist threats, you know, bypassing courts, bypassing kind of democratic institutions, democratically developed institutions in order to stamp out Islamist threats. And sometimes those Islamist threats are really poorly defined. Um, and we know that, um, you know, in targeting Islamist threats, illiberal kind of majoritarians, you know, organizations with very illiberal majoritarian sort of goals, what they've also been doing is targeting, you know, members of a political party that is a legitimate part of the Indonesian political system, which is PKS. You know, in a, in a majority Muslim country, you're going to have um, all sorts of um, religious organizations with all sorts of ideological kind of positions. Um, but they sort of, you know, I guess one one argument is that they should be kind of dealt with within the within within the kind of architecture of a liberal democracy. Um, and and that's not necessarily the approach taken by the Jokowi administration. Yes, and I, I didn't articulate this well in the presentation. I was moving through quickly with time, so I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, so in the kind of, I guess, one of the most powerful displays of the patronage, the patronage sort of based nature of Indonesian politics, Prabowo is now in government. He is Jokowi's Minister for Defence. Um, but what we have been finding and, you know, both qualitative, qualitative research being done in Indonesia and also the survey work being done is that at the grassroots, despite Prabowo being this sort of important figurehead for the Islamist movement for so long, his entry into government has not seemed to, um, you know, has not, has not kind of softened the divisions at the grassroots between those who would identify themselves as Islamists, who hold Islamist uh, sorts of views, um, and who continue to see Jokowi and these pluralist coalition uh, as their enemy, 
Um, and you know that that makes sense because for a lot of because this is a you know this is an ideological ideologically sort of based constituency within the Indonesian electorate that I think saw Prabowo as their figurehead because it was convenient and it was a relationship of convenience. Um, but at the electorate at, the, at that level, I think um, you know that constituency is now simply looking for a new figurehead. And Anis Baswedan, and the head of uh, the governor of Jakarta, is of course um, the the political leader who they now see as a kind of nominal sort of figurehead. Um, yes, more questions. Sorry. Thanks. Um, uh, we have a few questions on the chat. Uh, first is more on the methodological side of things. I I think. Hello, even Diego, great paper. This is from uh, Nick Orr. I would like to clarify whether you use a within subject design. If, yet, if yes, is there a measure to deal with uh, the carryover effects? Um, shall I take it, Eva? You want me yeah. to? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. All over it. <laughs> uh, so, no, it, it wasn't really like a within uh, subject design. Um, we do have repeated measures uh, with these like four big nets. Uh, so, it's uh, four uh, different like data points for each respondent, but each individual respondent is not experiencing the different conditions of control uh, and uh, uh, leader treatment or party cue treatment. So basically the, the condition is determined um, at the very uh, beginning of uh, the experimental session. And that is uh, uh, basically kept for all the four. Uh, for all the four questions. So um, we didn't really feel uh, there was much of a, a need to investigate uh, carryover effects. That said, uh, we do have an appendix to the paper with a, a series of robustness checks. Uh, uh, for example, what well, we have like balance, te balance tests. So we have, uh, as Eve mentioned, like the, the, the results that, that she has shown are based on a, on a full model with, a, with various different controls. We did the same uh, with uh, um, a very simple model with no controls at all, uh, and uh, the results um, basically uh, hold um, for for different for different kinds of assumptions. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the question. I hope that that clarifies it. That there's not uh, every person only has uh, only is assigned to to one specific uh, experimental condition. Yeah. Um, we have a question from uh, from Cherry and George. Uh, thanks for the question, Cherry. Uh, uh, Eve, do you want to do you want sure. to take it? Yeah, sure. Um, should I read it out, or does everyone just sure. read it? Um, yeah, sure. go ahead. Yeah, no. Um, thank you so much for the question. So it's wondering whether you know what this. You found it fascinating that we were able to find these authentic statements pushing divergent positions from opposing camps, um, and what this says about the roots of polarization. In theory, citizens should pay attention to the song, not the singer. Um, to what is said and not to what who is saying it. But if there's not substantive difference between candidates, can we blame voters, voters for focusing on personalities? I mean, that's a really, yeah, a really well put um, point. And I think it, um, what it remind when I was reading it, I was reminded of how when we first set out to design these experiments, what I was expecting to find and what I, the way we designed it, I really did expect to find that there'd be no party effect or a very little party effect compared to um, the leadership effect, because I thought this was all about personalities. Um, and you know what was interesting to me was the was that. And to be fair, you know these are parties that are very much sort of associated with these particular political leaders, so perhaps it's not that surprising. Uh, but in Indonesia, personalities matter immensely, uh, and indeed PDIP's popularity in Indonesia, while it has its kind of you know, stalwarts, like the people who are really kind of hard, PDIP, always have been PDIP voters, Jokowi's personality and the, the sort of the, the cult of personality that he has around him has really uh, improved and increased um, PDIP's vote share as well. Um, and I think that's right that, you know, when parties look and sound so similar and take similar positions on different things, then it's, it's the charisma and the personality of particular leaders uh, that attracts, you know, many, many voters. So what I think um, and certainly at the local level, you know, a lot, of been, a lot has been written about the personalization of politics in Indonesia. Um, but what I think is, is important to remember, and again, this is something that, you know, Diego's, the other research that Diego has done and that we've done together as well has shown, is that we, I think we continually underestimate the uh, effect of party and party ideology for some parties, not, you know, not for like the Hanuras, you know, um, 
or the NUSTEMs necessarily of this world, but for those parties that have been around Indonesia for a long time that have ideological roots, you know, all, all their other policy positions don't matter very much. And they can all be very similar and all very mixed up, but people will remain loyal to their party and um, based purely on the position those parties take when it comes to questions of state and Islam, state and pluralism, like that stuff still really matters to voters. It's a priority and that's, and people sort into and vote for parties that reflect their own ideological position when it comes to that one policy area. Um, yeah, again, how the rambling response. Uh, could I, could I uh, chip in a follow up? Um, you said at the start, and I thought this is so important that, I mean, polarization studies has been dominated by the US experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my head, I want to say that in the US, uh, there tends to be a more of this conflation between uh, polarization and partisanship. Mm -hmm. And Indonesia seems to be one of those settings that force us to actually realize that these are, uh, these can operate uh, orthogonally, I guess. Mm -hmm. Would I say more, I mean, is, is Indonesia unusual in the sense that we need to actually keep our eye on different balls, right? There's, there's partisanship, there's personality loyalty, there's polarization between uh, um, what you called um, political Islam and nationalism and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, do you mean, so are there other, yeah, so are we... Do, do, does, does Indonesia force us to rethink what, uh, say, the American literature um, highlights as partisan, uh, as polarization? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, and it's a question that that book that I sort of brought up before on Democracy is Divided, I think what, that's what it does really well, is it sort of says, here's the American case. And it's kind of, you know, it's the case that it really dominates the political science literature on polarization. But then it looks at the sort of different sorts of identity based cleavages, some of which are based inside the party system and reflected really well by political parties, which is, I guess, in some ways, is, is, is the Indonesian case as well. Uh, but then it looks at other sorts of uh, contexts where uh, political parties don't map on neatly all the time to the sorts of identity-based polarization that's taking place at the community level. And sometimes it does, and that's when polarization gets really intense, actually. It's when these, you know, political and uh, when these sort of identity-based cleavages, which can exist in all manner, you know, in, uh, at the local level, in sort of micro communities around a country, but it's actually when they become channeled into the party system in democracies that they become so dangerous. So I think you're right. I think we should be kind of looking at identity-based polarization outside of the political system, but it's when the two overlap. And that's sort of what that book sort of shows that the implications for uh, democratic institutions and a democratic regime uh, become uh, so, when it becomes so consequential, I think, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another uh, question by Angela Trito. I can summarize that for you, Eve. Um, uh, she's asking, um, she mentioned her work on uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative um, and asks us to elaborate a bit more on the China issue in Indonesia, on whether it was also a factor that contributed to this sort of polarization, uh, uh, anti-Chinese uh, sentiment. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and also she's asking how much, how many of the, uh, of the respondents were ethnic minorities. Okay, so I'll take question one and you can, I mean, I, yeah, you can take question two just for fun. Um, but so yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, you know, again, time p didn't permit me to go into all the sorts of, all, all the details, of, I guess, of the trajectory of polarization in Indonesia over the past few years. Uh, because even though 2014, the presidential elections in Indonesia were more divisive than uh, pre prior elections. You know, the, the Jokowi Prabowo kind of competition already sort of tended to divide the electorate. It was really the anti ahok movement in 2016 and 2017 that was sort of this watershed moment, I think, for Indonesian democracy. And, you know, it's, it's a very well-documented, you know, election now, but in essence, you know, there was an incumbent governor in Jakarta of ethnic Chinese, um, who was, it was ethnic Chinese, uh, governor Christian as well, sort of seen as a double minority in the Indonesian context. And he was also a Jokowi ally. So he had been Jokowi's deputy when Jokowi was governor. Uh, and he was backed by a kind of pluralist coalition uh, in, the, in, the, in the election in 2017. And he came up against Anis Baswedan, uh, who was backed by an Islamist coalition and backed by Prabowo. And so you had this kind of, sort of mini, you know, sort of, it was the same kind of competition, 
as the Jacobi Prabowo kind of competition, but this time the the the, the representative of the pluralist uh, constituency was himself an, a minority from a minority group, uh, and you know. As we all know, you know there was a really, really these huge street protests organised by, um, you know, extremist Islamic organisations headed up by FPE, from, which has now been banned from Bombay Islam. Uh, and you know, the all, all of a sudden, Indonesian politics was, you know, is, uh, electioneering had become so sectarian. You know, this was a country that, of course, you'd had serious sectarian violence at the end of the '90s and the early 2000s. But in, in terms of the way elections had been run, this was something extremely novel, very new. Uh, and um, just the, the, the kind of the overt anti-Chinese sentiment. And I think what that did, and what we know what that did, was uh, amongst minority communities in Indonesia and amongst the pluralist spaces, it really uh, rallied them, I think, leading up to 2019 to support Jokowi no matter what. Um, and no matter what Jokowi did, no matter what he's how, how what his policy how his policies were going along you know what kind of illegal interventions had been introduced in the meantime they saw Prabowo and his Islamist coalition as a kind of existential threat uh, and as representing this kind of you know, conservative puritanical Islamist majoritarianism uh, and and it was really that that anti-Chinese anti-pluralist um, display of power in 2017 that I think um, motivated such a strong, pluralist campaign, an anti-Islamist campaign in 2019 and since. Um, it's not so much connected to sort of anti-Chinese sentiment in terms of China, mainland China. It's very much about, you know, the kind of the position of, of the ethnic Chinese minority within Indonesia. Um, and yes, it was a representative survey, but if you want to talk about that, Diego. Yes, as for the uh, second question, I, I wouldn't be able to, 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 to say how many Chinese respondents we had, but uh, in terms of like the religious minorities, uh, the survey was representative of the population, so around like 15 or 17 percent or so, uh, were um, respondents from ethnic minorities. And uh, also in terms of ethnicity, uh, um, in terms of like share of like Javanese as opposed to like Santanese, uh, Indonesians, uh, or respondents from other ethnic groups, at least like uh, in terms of the, the main ethnic groups being represented, uh, the the survey sample was uh, quite close to the to the population. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, uh, another question by Muhammad Naim. Um, he's asking, how do you think about the role of uh, overthrowing Sukarno and purging of the left in the nineteen uh, in nineteen sixty five sixty six? Uh, by the Indonesian military in collaboration with Islamist parties which brought the authoritarian regime of Suharto to the coming three decades. How did that help that kind of tragic event to shape the patterns of polarized politics that we see today in Indonesia? Thank you. Um, well, I think it's, it's no coincidence, right, that since Jokowi's rise and the, ri and the sort of rise to power of PDIP, um, in the last sort of six years now that we've seen this sort of revival of anti-communist sort of rhetoric. Um, and, you know, when Prabowo was campaigning in 2014, I remember, you know, there's a great article written by Liam Gammon on New Mandela about Prabowo's dog whistling. Um, and some of that dog whistling was, you know, anti-Chinese um, sort of stuff, you know, kind of just using sort of words like ante ante asing to, you know, to kind of hint at um, anti-Chinese sort of sentiment to mobilize that, but also kind of hinting at, you know, sort of, it wasn't coming from Prabowo himself, but from his supporters and from um, others in his network were kind of cultivating this narrative that Jokowi was sort of a closet communist. Um, and what that meant was that if you're a closet communist, well, you're not a good Muslim. So he wasn't a good Muslim. He was probably had secular roots. In fact, he was probably a communist potentially his parents were Christian. And you know, these were the sorts of lies that were being produced by uh, Prabowo back in 2014. And they hung around. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's not that I think that those events have necessarily, you, sort of, you can't draw a direct line, but it's, I think it's, you know, those events and the, the Indonesia, that, that violent sort of history, um, which has never really been talked about openly and taught openly. And you can't have sort of open seminars about, you know, 
about those massacres and the role of the military and, and the role of an ooh and all, you know, you can't play those sorts of, you can't talk about that openly anymore. And I think all, what all that means is that those sorts of narratives um, and the kind of, you know, can, can get remobilized and repurposed uh, for, a con for a contemporary context. Um, and so I think that, you know, and, and what that's, what that, the consequences of that are, you know, are actually really important because Jokowi, who sort of has, has been quite a, despite being so secure, despite being a very popular uh, incumbent president, is, behaves like an insecure president in many ways. Um, and so he was so distressed by these accusations that he was a, you know, a, a, um, um, a, a Muslim that wasn't pious enough or didn't practice Islam well enough, that he was a closet communist and Christian, you know, he ended up taking a really hard stance on, on um, this idea that there was being a communist revival, you know, and he endorsed some of this anti-communist rhetoric and endorsed the closure of, you know, seminars and discussions about um, 65, 66 and the, and the tragedy. Um, so, yeah, I think that that the, the sort of that history is sort of alive and well, and, and it's certainly played a role in um, the narratives that have been mobilized in this sort of polarizing conflict. Uh, can I follow up? Sure. Yeah. No so, yeah, uh, so there is a recent book, uh, I think that came out last uh, year called The Jakarta Method, which is uh -huh. written by, uh, I, I think like you have read that, right? I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sorry, what, 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 what was it? Uh, a book which came out last year called The Jakarta Method by oh, Vincent yes, Bevins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, because uh, he wrote it, I think, when he was working for the Washington Post in Jakarta that time. Uh -huh. uh, what do you think about that? Like, because it really analyzes uh, uh, Indonesia's like role since that time, because it was literally like a newly independent country and mm. it was at the peak of the Cold War and then there was this uh, in an effort to switch camps because uh, Sukarno was very prominent in non-aligned movement and also towards mm. uh, very left I mean his party was PKI mm. and uh, then suddenly like there is overthrow and uh, for three decades uh, there was Suharto's regime and yeah. nothing was uh, discussed openly about this massacre which happened in 65-66. That's so what do you think about that book? Like uh, how? I haven't, to, to my shame, I haven't read it, but I know, um, okay. I know that he's a respected journalist and um, I think the reviews are good. And I, I mean, it's on my list, but I haven't actually read it. But I mean, it's interesting that this history continues to be such, it continues to be researched and to be investigated from so many different angles from different scholars because the official history uh, has, is, you know, as we know, remains and is, is so problematic. Um, and so the more people that work on this, I think the better. And I'm keen to read it, but I'm sorry I can't offer you my, a review. <laughs> Thank you. Right, any other questions for Eve? It's so compelling. No one's got any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mark yeah, I, I, sorry, I have one more question. I'm just curious, you know, given the methodological uh, questions, uh, what is the situation in terms of survey research in Indonesia response rate wise? I mean, you know, the one fascinating thing that's come out of the US context is the very low response rate. Mm. And, you know, one reason these uh, survey companies are having such a difficult time is they're getting, you know, one, two, three percent response rate. So what, what what's the situation like and how do you encourage participation uh, in, 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 in this kind of uh, project? It's quite a different landscape um, in Indonesia, I think. I mean, Diego, you can speak to this more because you're, you've done both face-to-face -face and, and online surveys, but, um, and I'm not sure of the, the actual numbers of response rate for Borhan's surveys with Indicator Politik. It's, it's um, usually they're, they're pretty, they're just still pretty high. Uh, this is, uh, however, surveys that are uh, they are conducted face to face, so probably the the figures that you mentioned, Mark, were um, more about like phone surveys. Yeah. Uh, uh, so here we had the privilege to actually um, conduct these surveys like face to face, which usually um, researchers don't really do because of the uh, tremendous costs that are that are involved. Uh, so this. Uh, uh, this data is the result of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about like uh, 
1,600 interviews uh, that were very carried out face-to-face -face all across Indonesia uh, in each and every province. And that required uh, employing a lot of enumerators, a lot of uh, researchers, training them and so forth. So when we do that, we see that response rates are actually quite uh, good. Mm. Uh, um, we're, we're thinking uh, about like 75, 80 uh, percent for, uh, for, for this service. But again, it, it does require like a lot of efforts of actually uh, showing up at these people's uh, home and maybe do another visit uh, if they're not immediately available and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I wouldn't know of a you know, of a, of a survey conducted over, over the phone usual, uh, using like uh, telephone directories or, uh, you know, this, this sort of lists uh, in, in the context of, of Indonesia. Um, COVID, of course, it is, has introduced like a, a, a big challenge. Uh, so one, um, one expedient um, that we have used like uh, uh, after the epidemic it hit uh, was to, uh, to rely, as as Eve mentioned, uh, this this co-author of uh, uh, of us has um, is heading one of the most prominent research institutes, uh, survey institutes there. So it has a lot of experience, years of surveys that have been conducted. So they did have a database of respondents that uh, you know already um, uh, basically expressed a willingness to uh, to to be interviewed, and uh, these are. Uh, respondents that were initially interviewed face to face. So we have a list of those and basically you can use that list that has like say 80,000 or so uh, individuals to sample from that list and just conduct a survey by, by phone. This is something that have, uh, we have done in one or two instances. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the, you know, the general uh, picture is, is one in which face-to-face uh, -face interviews are still possible, or at least they were until like one year ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I just add that this is also used in the Philippine context that strikes me maybe there's a journal article to be written why survey research and develop so-called developing democracies, as you call them, is better than in uh, established democracies. <laughs> Yeah, that's because, right. I mean, the U.S. U.S. survey researchers have a big problem. They they got it wrong again, and uh, you know these these this low response rate phone interviews doesn't work anymore. People, particularly the the pro Trump supporters, don't like to talk to the survey people, so they've got a big problem. That uh, the research here seems much more solid uh, for the reasons uh, list, uh, named. Yeah, that, that's that's right. I remember you know Borhan sort of because he follows all this debate about survey research in general and kind of, you know, s surveys that sort of fall into disrepute in America. And um, he and Budhan's Institute, I mean, in Indonesia, there are a lot of companies that get it wrong as well. And a lot of companies that are uh, sort of questionable in terms of their ethics. And, and they kind of, they're more, they're more sort of like, you know, pollsters for hire who will kind of come out and give a politician whatever, whatever, whatever results they want. You know, it's kind of, it's a mixed landscape, but they also have a really outstanding survey institute, several of them, and they get it right. And they get it really, you know, when it, when it comes to the kind of um, the quick counts, um, the sort of the polls leading up to it, sometimes it's missing, but they, they do a very good job and it could be, the, and it could be in part related to this, this very fact that they're still able to go about and do these face-to-face -face surveys with high response rates. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? A couple of our participants in the audience have left. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Question from Nick. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Eve and uh, Diago, for the wonderful paper. Um, so, one thing that strikes me is that so if the founding is that so people in democracy can you know, deviate from the norm of democracy and then they express the view that we should, for example, then receive civil liberty, etc. But one thing that strikes me is that, um, is there any relevant work that talk about how Indonesians understand what is democracy? Uh, you, you know, you know what it means, right? So, so maybe not everyone is that uh, well educated or well informed on kind of the ideal form of democracy. So maybe they kind of tended to say that, oh, this is maybe 
possible okay to limit a little bit in order to, for example, make the government run better, more efficient, deal with you know, a lot of public policy problem, etc. So it could it could be this case. So I'm I'm just because I don't know much about Indonesian politics. So it's a shame, really. But yeah, I just want to hear uh, what, what's your understanding on the, of this as well. Uh, it, it's a really good question. I'll, I'll let Diego answer some of that because he's doing work on this on this very topic, just the conceptions of democracy in Indonesia and other countries in the region. Um, but just quickly, I mean, I, th I think you make a very good point. And when we asked Indonesians and politicians, in fact, we did a survey of politicians recently as well, um, and we asked them a whole series of questions. Some of these are based on the questions that get asked in the Asia Barometer um, survey. And when you ask them sort of what, what they think democracy is, you give them a whole choice of different questions that are related to different aspects of democracy. And actually what we find is a lot of Indonesians understand democracy in terms of sort of substantive economic policy outcomes. Um, and you can also sort of see that in when you when you ask Indonesians how democracy is traveling, how it's working in their country, um, what Bodhan has tracked over time is that, you know, people's satisfaction with democracy is often um, tied to inflation. It's just tied to their general kind of happiness with you know, how the government is performing, how much things are costing them. It's a kind of, sometimes they just see it as like, you know, democracy is government performance, you know, as opposed to, as you say, specific um, specific institutions designed to protect uh, civil liberties or competition or whatever. Um, having said that, I'm not sure that that helps us explain the phenomenon that we're seeing now. So, you know, what, what you know, the way that we designed our survey was, it probably doesn't, it doesn't really matter how you conceive of democracy because in the control group, um, you know, people from these different partisan groups are all looking really similar and then you add this treatment effect and um, whatever your conception of democracy might be the point really is that you know the partisans follow the leader and they follow them um you know to a to a more illiberal kind of uh direction or they follow them to a more democratic or liberal direction the point is they're trusting in and they're just uh, uh following their partisan loyalties rather than their kind of um, understand, yeah their understanding of these policies and i think the most important one to me and most interesting to me was the question of direct elections, because that's a really foundational, you know, ob obviously the mo one of the most critical foundations of a, of, a, of a democracy. It's really it's understood well by Indonesians. They're always polled about their support for direct elections. They love direct elections. Um, and you could see in that control group, you know, everyone said, and you could see when we showed you the descriptive statistics that, you know, a vast majority of Indonesians across partisan groups support direct elections. But even that, you know, even, even that particular institution uh, is subject to a kind of is is you know people's support shifted dramatically in the in the treatment group, you know such that a major I think it was just over fifty percent a majority of of Prabowo supporters or even more, um, you know said that they would support abolishing direct elections, when told that a, even a Gerindra politician not just Prabowo himself but just someone from the party or the party endorses that position and they moved and that was. I think the most, I guess, dramatic outcome for me, you know, asking people about that, that very specific and, you know, um, a very salient, you know, democratic institution. Diego, yeah. I want to make some comments about conceptions of democracy, because I know you're doing really interesting um, work. Yes, I um, did publish a couple of, um, well, first of all, a chapter in a, in a book that edited, uh, uh, that Eve edited on uh, democratic decline in Indonesia. And what we did basically uh, was to focus specifically on that, on conceptions of democracy, we started with uh, you know this framework you might be familiar with of varieties of democracy this idea that uh, you know there are like five main dimensions of democracy electoral liberal participatory and so forth and um, basically we asked uh, uh, respondents uh, in indonesia about uh, each of these dimensions and then we looked at their answers uh, with uh, with factor analysis and what we found is that uh, there are like two main conceptions of democracy. One is uh, uh, kind of like a fusion of some liberal elements, but also uh, very much uh, a substantive uh, conception of democracy in which uh, things such as policy outcomes and good government, not, no governance do matter. And the other is a more uh, participatory uh, uh, conceptions of democracy. One that looks at uh, things like uh, informal participation, civic engagement, uh, having a say, and this sort of things. And what we found in the analysis is that th the kind of conceptions you have uh, determines whether or not you are satisfied with democracy. And especially uh, uh, people who are who have this kind of like liberal, predominant liberal. Uh, substantive uh, conceptions of democracy are much more likely to be dissatisfied with the current state uh, 
of democracy, as, again, as uh, uh, you would think, given the recent uh, developments. And also that intersects with the, the kind of like political cleavage uh, between Islam and pluralism. Um, Islamists are substantially, not surprisingly, much less likely to have a, the kind of like liberal ideas about, uh, about democracy. Thank you very much for your, yeah, very enlightening talk, really. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot for attending. Um, uh, any other questions? We still have a couple of minutes. There's one quick one, there's one last minute one in there. A background of respondents, occupational ethnicities, language differences have any role uh, in their perceptions and contributions to party polarization. Um, I mean, we, yeah, Diego, do you want to answer that? I, I'm up to you. Um, we did have some, um, we did some analysis uh, to investigate um, whether people were responding differently from the treatment to investigate like heterogeneity in, uh, uh, in treatment effect. And uh, I think if, if, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't really find, uh, we didn't really find much. We investigated, for example, if, uh, especially the role of education and political knowledge, uh, whether say people who are uh, more interested, more knowledgeable about politics, uh, respond to this kind of partisan cues that differently. Um, we didn't find uh, we didn't find much. The effect of uh, partisanship, partisan cues or leader cues appears to be quite robust across different uh, social groups and quite strong. Uh, that said, uh, I should also add that uh, uh, you know we didn't have like for for some of these categories we didn't have like that many people. Uh, that many respondents. So our analysis was a bit constrained uh, by, uh, by smaller numbers when we were investigating this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of factors. Remember, each of these uh, experimental groups only has like 400 people. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're looking at uh, things like the ones you mentioned, like, uh, uh, you know, ethnicity or profession, we're talking about like very few respondents in each uh, category. So uh, it's something that could be uh, identified, could be explored in, in, in new research, in additional research. Very well, let's see if we have any other questions, otherwise we can wrap it up.